welcome to MBA. Today we're going to have a look at ethical issues in psychological research and how the ethical guidelines have changed to make the world of psychological research a better place. Psychologists at work today show respect to the people who participate in their research. Psychologists have scientific integrity. They don't tell big fat lies about their research findings. They have social responsibility and their days are filled by finding ways to benefit individuals and society as a whole. They look to maximise benefit and minimise harm. In fact, this is what is recommended by the British Psychological Society's Code of Human Research Ethics. These are respect, scientific integrity, social responsibility, maximise benefit and minimise harm. Each country has a set of ethical guidelines that every psychologist must follow. In Britain, we follow the British Psychological Society's Code of Human Research Ethics, and it gets regularly updated. It's been said that psychology has a dark past. At the start of the last century, when psychology was a relatively new science in comparison to its older cousins, the physical sciences, there were no ethical guidelines to follow, and psychologists did pretty much whatever they wanted to. If you were to Google unethical psychological experiments, you'd read about some shocking things that were done in the name of science. During your study of GCSE psychology, you're going to learn about some pretty unethical studies. The reason being is that we can learn from their mistakes and understand why it's so essential to have ethical guidelines. Today, we're going to look at these terms. As you learn about them, Think about how you could apply them to any of the psychological research that you've learned about already. Informed consent. Before they take part in a study, participants agree to participate once they know what the experiment is about. Deception. Psychologists should avoid deceiving or lying to their participants. Debrief. After the study is finished, the researchers tell the participants what the study was all about and give them a chance to answer any questions they might have. If the researcher lied or deceived their participants, now's the time to put things right. Confidentiality. Researchers should not reveal the identity of their participants. Sometimes researchers will use the participants initials or give them a code instead of using their name. Protection of participants. Participants should be protected from both physical and psychological harm. Right to withdraw. Participants should know that they can withdraw from the study at any time and should never be made to feel like they have to be there or can't leave. Can you think of a study you know from psychology that did not follow these guidelines? Let's take the Stanford prison experiment as an example. Though all the participants consented to take part, it could not be considered informed consent as they did not know what they were agreeing to. Deception? Oh yes, those boys were most definitely misled about what was going to happen to them. Protection of participants? No, they were not protected from psychological harm by Haney, Banks and Zimbardo. And the prisoners were not protected from physical harm either. Right to withdraw? Technically, they did have the right to withdraw, but the research team made them think that they couldn't leave the prison. What went on in the name of psychology in the early 1970s would never be allowed to happen now. Phew. Now that you know about the ethical guidelines that psychologists must follow, you can think about whether the studies you have learnt about have followed the guidelines correctly or not. When you make notes for each piece of research that you learn about, you should include ethical considerations when considering the study's strengths and weaknesses. I hope this has been a helpful introduction to some of the ethics behind psychological research. I'm Kate with MVA. Thanks for watching.